Hello, everyone. As you can see on our welcome slide, we'll be getting started in just about five, six minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern. In the meantime, if you could take just a couple moments in the chat box, for those of you familiar with Zoom down the bottom, uh, please put in there where you're from. We've had people from all over the globe register for this wonderful event. And think about it for a second, but please define compost. How do you define compost? Put that in there so we can each look at it and see how everybody thinks. And we'll be with you in just a few moments. We're five minutes to beginning our webinar. As you can see on the slide, please take a couple moments in the chat box to list where you're from. And if you wouldn't mind, take a second to think about how you would define compost. And as you can see, some of the chats are coming in. So far, Venezuela, South America, actually in Maryland, but we'll consider that one our father's away at the moment.
It will be getting started in two minutes, but in the meantime, for those of you that just joined, if you could please take a moment and add to the chat box where you're located at. And a definition of compost as you see it. And Israel has popped up, outstanding. One minute away. Okay, based on my phone, it is now 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Would like to start our webinar. Did the, now, of course, it doesn't want to go down. There we go. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. My name is Gary Gutier. I am with McGill Environmental Systems, a sales and marketing manager, and the current president of the North Carolina Composting Council. It is my pleasure to host today's event uh, featuring Finian Makepeace. What a cool name is that? Um, he will be helping us kick off International Compost Awareness Week 2021. Uh, we will be muting everyone and you will not have your video available, obviously, uh, but please go ahead and share anything in the chat. Uh, we also will be recording, correct, Kate? Correct. So we'll make the recording available afterwards. And we will make it available afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, Finian will speak for about 35 or 40 minutes. We'll leave us enough time at the end to answer some questions. If you could, please put those in that little Q&A box up top. All right. So I um, want to recognize the state chapters with the U.S. Composting Council that have made today possible. I believe Linda, who is with the U.S. Composting Council, wants to say something for a moment. I just really wanted to say, as the Chapter Relations Director for USCC, I wanted to thank the North Carolina Composting Council for having the fantastic idea to put this webinar together. Um, we hope all of you who are in our chapter of states um, will enjoy this. If you want to find out what state USCC chapters are at, go to compostingcouncil.org forward slash state chapters. And if you're interested in starting a state chapter, just let us know in the chat or look on that um, page and you can find out some information about how. And I wish you all a great International Compost Awareness Week. Thank you, North Carolina, for putting this on and the supporting chapters who helped. All right, great. Thank you, Linda. And yes, a special thanks to the presenting chapters who uh, provided the funds to offer the donation to Kiss the Ground and allow Finian to be with us today and all the other state chapters to help promote uh, and create such a wonderful event. Um, if you are unaware of the Compost Research and Education Foundation, please take a moment to click on to that link when we get done here and you'll learn a little bit more about uh, this arm of the U.S. Composting Council, as well as seeing what all the chapters and the areas throughout the country are doing here this week at International Compost Awareness Week. 
And as Linda mentioned, there is a link here to talk a little bit about or learn a little bit more about uh, the state chapters themselves. And if you could um, think about maybe supporting us by becoming involved as a volunteer, uh, a member, um, or as Linda mentioned, if you're in a state that does not currently have a state chapter, think about trying to put one together. Okay, Kate's going to kick off a quick survey. Let's just take a moment or so. Hi everybody, I'm Kate Sullivan with the North Carolina Composting Council. Uh, real quick, I just got a message that someone can't hear us. If someone could please just send a yes, if you can hear us in the chat. We can hear you, I it must be her. Yeah. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and launch a quick poll here just to get an idea of who's in the audience. You take just a moment and fill out these questions. For question number two, if you have not seen Kiss the Ground, it's available on Netflix as well as Vimeo. So we'll be sure to put the links out for that. It's only a dollar on Vimeo if you don't have Netflix. Wow. Getting a lot of response. That's great, guys. Thank you. Yes. Give it just about 30 more seconds. Got most responses. All right, we got about 76% response. So we've got everyone from compost manufacturers to regulators, people that compost at home, uh, pretty split as far as who's seen the film and who has not. Uh, all over the map in terms of how many years in the compost industry, uh, 24 folks with over 15 years. That's fantastic. And then lots of people that we need to get involved with your state chapter. So we'll be sure to send out some communications after this so you can get involved. So thank you all very much for filling out the survey. And I'll turn it back to you, Gary. Thanks, Kate. All right. Let me get rid of that on my screen. You can read Finian's uh, bio here, but uh, I'd like to introduce him as somebody that uh, I've had the for uh, fortune of being able to see present. And if many of you, or some of you have, uh, you know he is an extremely dynamic presenter, uh, very knowledgeable, and most importantly, extremely passionate. Uh, I think his third to the last line here really sums up to me what I think is awesome is his greatest hope is that through awakening to the opportunities of regeneration, people know they can help change the world. That aligns extremely well with not only everyone in the composting industry, but myself and I believe most of you I would think you're on the call today. So with that opinion, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm going to stop sharing and we look forward to listening to you go. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Gary, and everyone who is here today. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the compost industry. It's been uh, incredible to, to connect with you all over the years uh, and incredibly welcoming community. I felt honored to be welcomed and participate in, in this Linda, if you're out there, if you hear this, uh, how long ago was it that the compost story was launched on International Compost Awareness Week? Was that four years ago? I believe it was four years ago. That was really fun to work with probably many of you here to, uh, to share the compost story. Um, Today, my intention is really to see how we can bring those of you who are deep in composting, interested in composting, connect you all more and join forces with the regenerative ag and soil health movement and see how what you're doing is so deeply connected to this movement and this movement uh, 
wants your participation and I'm really committed to that happening. And I hope that all of you gain some uh, potential insights here to advance that happening uh, and really what's going on around the world in soil health and including the compost industry is really, really essential. Kiss the Ground's mission is awakening people to the possibilities of regeneration. And what we're gonna talk a lot today about is moving from the sustain uh, mindset to what we think of as regeneration and regenerating and how that framework can be an essential part of your work in composting, whether you're trying to get your city to utilize compost for landscaping or make it some kind of incentive, or you're trying to pass state laws. Uh, this context, I think, is crucial to start from where we're having a conversation that begins from here and then allows for the why of compost to land so substantially for other people you're engaging with. Um, and a big theme is compost to regenerate earth. And that's really where we're gonna be crossing over from farmers to landscape to backyards and how really this is an opportunity to regenerate earth. And that's again, that, that re the reconnecting back to our, our mindset of sustaining versus regenerating. So the theory of change that Kiss the Ground works with is that, and most people work in, is that our views dictate our actions that dictate our outcomes. So when we talk about a new view, why it's so essential is that is what dictates new actions and new outcomes. So inside of this, what we're trying, why we're emphasizing this and why there is a circle around new view, a yellow circle here is to say, how can we collectively create a new perspective or view that people are seeing compost through? So how are they understanding it in, in a way that's moving them uh, possibly in a different way than they previously were uh, connecting with compost on? So I think that's, that's an opportunity there. And I really hope that all of you start to take this challenge to work on creating a new view for uh, the folks you're engaging with. And that directly leads to this, this question of how do we have successful movements? In so many ways, the compost industry has been successful. And I would say to a certain extent that has proliferated around the world, but there seems to be this limit and that's part of what I'm, I'm really passionate about is activating advocacy or activism or uh, communications inside of groups or individuals who are in the compost industry. So again, we have awareness here circled and we're saying, okay, awareness leads to actions and outcomes, but this, this is about a movement. So what happens often with movements is they tend to reach a point of awareness building, and then they have actions happening and outcomes occurring. But the limit comes with how many people are aware of something. And why this is circled is saying, wait a minute, why are we allowing ourselves to slow down on the awareness building side of it? If we haven't hit critical mass, we're going to make it so this, this movement potentially doesn't uh, proliferate to its biggest capacity. So what I'm saying here is every person, whether you're acting and make, you're doing something in composting or you're the one creating outcomes or you did it 10 years ago, every person can participate in the awareness building side. And when we recognize that, that's when we, uh, as a movement, we can have something reach critical mass where it really does shift uh, human trajectory of, of what our actions are. So that's what I'm imploring everyone to do is to say, where am I, whether what part I play in the industry or what part I play in my own individual composting, where am I limiting myself to where I can be a vehicle or a means to spread awareness? Because literally every single person here can, whether it's posting one image on Facebook or telling someone a story about composting, you can begin to stretch in this area of awareness building. You can participate more 
than you're doing right now. There's no argument. You can't argue with that because you could obviously become the only thing you're doing is promoting compost, for example. So that's the first thing to check into. Where are you limiting yourself in terms of your participation in awareness building for this movement? Are you waiting every year till International Compost Awareness Week? Maybe. Are you, are you saying, oh, I run a company, but nobody wants to hear about compost? Maybe. I don't know what your story is, but check into that right now. Let's just take a quick moment, check into where your limiting beliefs of your own involvement come from or wh where they are right now. So for me, one I just came up with was, well, how often should I share with people online, Instagram lives, my compost at home strategy? And I often say, well, my backyard's a little too messy or well, oh, I don't feel like it today. But every time I do it, there's an insanely great response of people being like, oh, wow, I didn't know that was the trick to have this more successful. Or that's a great idea to put a brown bin right next to my, my compost bin. But the point I saw was immediately there was a limit of like, I'm containing myself. I'm not sharing these ideas with the world. So that was just an, an example of, of seeing where limits are. All right, so we had some, I don't know if I can see the chat here still. Oh, whoops. Um, I can't see the chat here still, but I read some while they were coming in. And as you came in, we were asking this question, what is compost? And what I really wanna reframe that to is, what is compost's offer? Meaning, how are you or your company or the people you're working with, how are you looking into this question? So your homework, no matter if you work in a large group or you work in a city, municipality, whatever, discuss this with your coworkers, discuss this with the people in your house, uh, if you're composting of, or who, who don't agree with you that, that you should be composting. Whoever this is, I guarantee if you do work on what is compost and more specifically, what is compost's offer, you're going to see many things. First of all, that you might not have dialed in with your whole group that you're working with an agreement of what compost is and what that offer is really for all of you. So it's a time for bringing that together, a time for galvanizing your collective thought of what compost is. And you'll probably start to pull out places that you were missing or you'll see insights of where you might be lacking in how you're describing compost where you're limiting compost's offer. So that's such another challenge to you is to check into this question, work on it with your colleagues or, or other individuals to really find out how you're talking about compost. How does that sound coming out of your mouth? Practice saying it. It will surprise you what you're, as someone who's in the industry or not, uh, what your current limit is or where you wanna have that go further. So this is a great quote from the great Albert Einstein. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And this goes back to that first slide I was showing about moving from sustainable think to regenerative. I argue that humanity is in a perpetual sustainable think lock. And there's a major problem with it because our earth can't handle sustainability right now. So 10,000 years, arguably, <clears throat> humans have been degrading our planet. Uh, in most cultures, to produce our food and fiber and fuel, we've been degrading landscape function or carrying capacity of an ecosystem. That's just the matter of fact in most places. Many indigenous cultures around the world haven't been, but in most cases, as populations increase, humans degrade the environment in which they're feeding themselves from. So we're at this point here. We're at this point where sustainability doesn't make sense anymore. And that's where we're saying regeneration is the necessary next move for humanity to participate in. And then we can talk about sustainability. Quick note for people who have sustainability in your title, there's nothing wrong with it. You're just way ahead of your time and you're, you're just a futurist or, or, or the like. So, this is critical for us to grasp as we begin to explore what compost means to us and how we're talking about it. 
are we talking about it as a means for regeneration, as a critical part of regenerating land? So that's a different framing. If, if you've been lumping compost helps with sustainability, okay, really check into what does that mean? We're going to be unlocking today. Compost isn't uh, uh, made for sustainability. In some cases, it could be. Arguably, you can get no increases or decreases. It could just be flatlining. But compost has the opportunity to play an integral role in regenerating ecosystems. And that's really what, what's so profound and magical about compost as a regenerative substance. OK, next slide. And this is just grasping the reality, whether you're in landscapes and seeing landscapes across uh, the country or, or different countries around the world, um, you're going to see this more and more and more. Our soil is broken and it's sick. It's not working properly. And when we start to grasp the state of our soils, the, the technical broken, unfunctioning element of our soils. So when we have wind erosion in the top left, when we have water erosion in these two pictures with the muddy water, that means the soil isn't functioning properly and the soil plant system is broken. So this is where we start to look around and say, wait a minute, there's a ginormous problem. And with ginormous problems, obviously become ginormous opportunities. So really what, why I'm posing this in the, in the frame of broken is when something's broken, the opportunity is it, it can be fixed. So this is just another picture I didn't know was here. So I thought it was going to the next slide, but our, this is just in your face. Our land isn't functioning. That soil right there is not how the evolution of life on land made soil system work. Otherwise we would have no soil on, on our land. So this is an analogy of a broken cup. Right now our land is acting broken and the purpose of the cup was to hold liquid, but with a broken cup, it holds a limited amount of liquid or no liquid. So our strategies have often become, how do we maximize the ability of the broken cup to give us what we need? Meaning how are we doing uh, precision watering or how are we adding more chemicals to get the very best we can get out of this, this field, but not recognizing that the cup itself is broken. So here, is the big news. We can rebuild soil and glue it back together. Just like the analogy of the cup, we can glue soil back together so it functions again. So you get a cup can hold, whoop, this is my fancy background. The cup can hold water again if we glue it back together. Soil can function again and hold water if we glue it back together. And I'll explain that more in a second. So we're rushing through a lot of things here, but it's because it's a short presentation. So this comes to the next question of where does soil come from? And this is a really important part of what I want each of you to recognize today and recognize compost's role. So compost is an amazing amendment, but the really exciting news about compost isn't that it's an amazing amendment. We all know that. So what I wanna explain right now is critical, I think, to a new part of the story for compost. So just because I don't have anything else, I'm gonna, I don't know if I can take that plant right there. All right, I can't, the plant I was trying to show you is too big, so I'm just gonna explain it. Where does soil come from? The picture behind me of these two little root vegetables is really important to look at for a minute. When we say carbon in the atmosphere comes through a living plant, through photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is taken from the atmosphere. The sun's energy combines, takes the carbon, breaks the carbon off from the carbon dioxide, connects it with hydrogen and water, uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, from H2O water and makes uh, glucose molecules that turn in, in with the liquid in the water. And that's what the plant pumps through its body to build itself. Okay. So the carrot behind me is also made of that carbon. What we didn't know, and these root vegetables aren't the exact perfect depiction of it. 
But what we didn't know was how much of that liquid carbohydrates or liquid glucose that plants are leaking out of their roots to feed microorganisms in the soil. This is critical to have us all grasp. The big news revolution, revelation of why we're so excited about carbon sequestration, why Kiss the Ground the film was made, was because we didn't know how much plants were pumping liquid sugars into the ground to feed microorganisms. So soil is built from thin air. Plants are pumping in liquid sugars into the ground to feed microbes. 30 to 40% of those liquid sugars are fed into the ground to feed microbes who in exchange, we call it the big exchange, they're providing minerals, uh, access to minerals and water. So you have this constant pump of liquid sugar going into the ground from the plant and the microorganisms right at the root zone are making minerals available for the plant. So they consume that sugary carbon uh, liquid and in return, they're making the minerals available to the plant and things like mycorrhizal fungi and others are also making water more available to the plant. In their life and death cycle, these organisms are creating glues that bind the soil together and aggregate it, turning the soil into a sponge-like soil structure. This is a picture of an aggregate. It looks like I glued it together with some spray glue, but that is not the roots doing that. The roots you can see are very skinny, but they're not holding the soil together. The roots fed the microorganisms that created glues that glue that soil particles together. So that pump of carbon to feed the microbes and the microbes creating the glues, and this is a carbon glued super sponge that can hold 20 times its weight in water. Okay, we're, we're still getting to the kicker around compost, so bear with me here. So that's the big revelation that we can have a carbon pump going into the ground, feeding microbes who are creating healthy aggregated soil and creating this amazing positive feedback loop. Here it is in nature's design. You see a bare field, you see a bare landscape. And for all of you landscapers out there, just applying compost to the photo on the left is so much more a version of what we would consider sustainable or technically not helping the final condition. Because without plants, you're still just having a loss of carbon dioxide. So if I took a bunch of compost on that bare ground and applied it, I would have amended soil and the soil would be a bit better because it have higher organic content. But if I didn't have any plants grow on that soil throughout the year, the only thing that would happen is that carbon would be consumed and turned back into CO2. So plants are essential in having carbon enter the system, getting a net carbon gain. So plants are also designed as, as you have more organic material, you're also gonna have more life in the soil, which means more carbon eaten, which means more CO2 put up, but plants figured that out. They have a bunch of stomata under their leaves. And when the carbon comes up, they capture a bunch of it and recycle it and pump more of it down into the ground as carbohydrates to feed the microorganisms. So nature designed itself to be a net carbon sink. So again, really important. If you're a landscaper and you're talking about compost as being regenerative, I think that's great. But if you're just applying compost onto bare land and amending the soil and having like three little plants and then a bunch of bare ground, you're, you could be doing a nice garden, but you're not technically having a net carbon gain in that soil. Over time, that soil is going to oxidize and turn back into CO2, and you're just not going to get a net carbon gain. You can make better soil, more fertile for a time, but you're not actually making the system function better and have more carbon storage over time. Great. So the whole idea here is how do we maximize photosynthesis? How do we make it so plants can pump more carbon into the ground, feed the microbes who can hold uh, who can create glues that make soil structure so soil holds more water and makes more nutrients available for plants, getting more plant growth. And then you have more plant growth, you have more sugars being pumped into the ground, 
you have more microbes, you have more aggregation, more spongy soil, et cetera, et cetera. That's the regenerative feedback loop that we're talking about. Now we're gonna talk about how compost is a big part of that. So compost, one of the most essential parts of compost is that it has life in it, but it's not just the life here. So when we see this regenerative symbol, why it's designed like this is it's indicating that we can start from a diminished state and then increase in our capacity or increase in the abundance of life, increase in the amount of carbon. It's, it's a perpetual uh, increase versus decrease. So compost, as you might've seen in the, in the compost story is saying it provides microbial life. So in a dead soil, amending with compost, you're providing essential microbes. And many of you have probably heard that in a healthy teaspoon of soil, there can be more organisms than there are humans on planet earth. That's an incredible amount of organisms. And so many of them are essential to helping the plant help the system. What I mean by that is how are we encouraging a plant, this is its roots, to share its liquid sugars. If there are no microbes in the soil, reach, research shows that plants share less of their sugars. If there is life in the soil, meaning the plants will get an advantage if they share sugars and those populations of, of life explode because those organisms will make nutrients and water more available to the plant. It's an exchange after all, right? So when we provide microbial life, we're incentivizing the plants to share their liquid sugars with the soil, which jumpstarts that perpetual regenerative cycle. They also have slow release nutrients, meaning of nutrients that are available upon demand by the plant. Perfect nature's technology, right? And they also are providing water retaining humus. So they're actually helping with that initial uh, infrastructure, if you will, of the soil's ability to store and retain water, which will then help with giving the plant access to water uh, and means more photosynthesis, which means more carbon pumped in the ground, et cetera. You get this point of the regenerative feedback loop can occur when we apply compost. So here are the findings from an incredibly important, you might wanna take a screenshot of this and I'll leave it up for the screen for you to do that. This is really important. A study that was done by the Marine Carbon Project that really highlights the important aspect that we're saying here and this kind of thing we didn't know. We found that a single one-time application of compost doubled forage production, increasing 40 to 70%. And the soil carbon sequestration on average 2.4 tons per acre over three years on both coastal wet and Sierra foothill dry Mediterranean, Mediterranean grassland systems. Compost decomposition provides a slow release fertilizer to the soils leading to increases in carbon sequestration and plant production. Net ecosystem carbon storage increased by 25 to 70% without including the direct addition of compost carbon. While compost had no effect on nitrous oxide and 2 o or CH4 emissions. This is super critical. So get what they said, a net carbon storage increased 25 to 70% without including the direct addition of compost carbon. I hope everyone grasps what this is saying. This is changing the paradigm of thinking compost as an amendment, as an addition thing, where we're saying, here's my soil container. I'm just gonna mix in some compost. Now I have better soil. No, that's not the point. That's cool, that's great, but that's not the really exciting news. The exciting news is that it increased carbon storage, not because of what you added, but because of the phenomenon of increasing how much plants were pumping liquid sugars into the ground to make carbon storage. Really critical. That's the regenerative phenomenon. That's really grasping that this compost is a regenerative substance, is a probiotic for our soils. And that I think changes the conversation. Some of your answers were awesome, but that a lot of people were saying it's an amendment. It's this thing that we can add. You're essentially equating it just to another fertilizer. You're not saying it has this insanely amazing potential to create a regenerative feedback loop, but also 
increase carbon storage significantly. Simply compost increases photosynthesis plant growth and therefore the ability of plants to sequester carbon and build soil structure, build back soil structure. And here it is. Organics and landfills obviously creating major havoc but when we're applying compost on rangelands, on vineyards, on landscapes, again, when there are photosynthesizing plants. Reminder, compost can be a great fertilizer and amendment, but it doesn't have its regenerative tendencies if you're not having plants covering the ground, increasing their photosynthetic capacity. Really wanna make that clear. And of course, compost in the landfills creates uh, terrible situations with lots of methane, and you all know about that. So uh, by the way, if anyone wants these slides, you can take soil advocate training and get them and, and do these presentations yourself, of course. So this is really exciting, where we, we get to understand that the role of compost in the farming communities, in the regenerative soil health movement, becomes really amazing, where we're saying, <clears throat> How can the compost industry start interacting? Oh, Linda, did you want to say something? It's still yakking. Like he... Oh, you're you're unmuted there, Linda. How can the compost industry begin to start interacting more with the agriculture industry and, and starting to have yeah. communities yeah. at large yeah. able to yeah. participate in getting compost back to farms so that it can provide this regenerative feedback loop. Linda, you're, you're unmuted there if you, if you. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Yeah. So this is where it's saying we can, we can grow back functioning soil. If you look at that soil there, that's, that's incredible. They've built, I don't know, I think like 23 inches of topsoil in like 10 year period or something crazy. So compost is this regenerative substance that can really be helping farmers in the advancement of regenerative agriculture. So please expand your scope to start seeing how your municipalities or your communities can start really seeing compost as a key jump starter uh, for farmers heading into regenerative agriculture. And this is one last thing I wanted to say on, on this is basically when we talk about the, the profound impact, when you have the case of water being able to be absorbed in that system, when we talk about the initial setup of having compost as, as this water holding amendment uh, with all of those humates and humus in there, we have an incredible help. But then as that system proliferates, you're creating the conditions of a sponge versus comp compaction and runoff. So I know how so many of you as landscapers or others out there have been on people's land that are, is completely compacted and they're losing their, uh, their, all of their rainwater and then they're having to water throughout the, the year with compost and then having regenerative practices as well, uh, you can have significant increases of water capture. So me, for example, people say, oh, yards are terrible. Are yards terrible? Or is it just how we're managing them? Is grass the devil <laughs> or not? Like it really has to do with how you manage it. If you apply compost in the wet season in, in Los Angeles and have, have grass and don't cut it too short, you can have really great grass that has very little maintenance required for watering because you've helped the system work and you're not just having a layer of grass on top of hard panned soil that so many of our, our lawns are like. So again, it's how, it's not necessarily what, but this is helpful to understand for, for that. Okay, so I'm committed that you all start sharing compost as a regenerative, whoop, does it just say as a regenerative? Is it not, doesn't say substance? <laughs> oh, as regenerative, sharing compost as regenerative, perfect. So this is really the, I think an opportunity for the compost industry to step it up and say, okay, how are we going to work collectively and individually to really start to amplify this? And I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to, to get you educated on this so that you, you feel more confident in doing that. But uh, for example, I know that a lot of people have seen it useful, but the, the compost story we created for the compost industry to be able to tell more directly the kind of compost uh, 2.0 version. So I'm just going to skip through, through some of these slides and Linda can probably give you access to these if you all want them. Uh, these are some celebrities talking about compost um, from the compost story.
And you can obviously create your own versions of these. But reminder, this is that first thing I asked you earlier was like, where are you limiting yourself? Could you have come up with this graphic? Should you? You can borrow it, of course, but make a new one. Why not? Say it on a podcast. Who knows? This was a fun one. When I was making the compost story, I was trying to equate how heavy this was. And I equated it to four and a half great pyramids was the amount of food waste in the US every year just to get people's mind wrapped around it so they can see it in their head. So compost can help humanity live regeneratively. And this is the, the difference of living sustainably is, is living regeneratively as humans as a contribution to helping ecosystem function, helping get our water cycle back, helping get our underground water supplies back and restored, helping biodiversity come back in desertified areas, helping carbon sequestration, such an ability. Oh, here, here's the list. <laughs> we have the ability to rebuild soils, restore fertility, replenish water sources, reduce flooding and drought, reverse global warming. That's the carbon sequestration part. And your job is to spread more awareness. So <clears throat> you obviously do awesome things, but I'm here to be your champion to spread more awareness because I know you can do it. And I'm, I'm here to help you and empower you to do so. Um, a reminder here again, awareness is the uh, beginning of all the actions and outcomes that you're hoping for. Why aren't people composting more? They don't get it or not enough of them get it. <clears throat> Critical mass hasn't been reached where there's a collective agreement that compost by all means necessary, that's not shouted by every mayor across the nation or the world. That's not, uh, that's not the top of TikTok of compost by any means necessary you all can help contribute to making that happen. How we're gonna do it, that's for all of us to figure out. Okay, we need to build back soil so that land functions again. The glue to build back the soil structure comes from CO2 uh, that currently is causing a problem. Compost helps plants pump more carbon into the ground. Ancient proverb. It's not really an ancient proverb, I just thought that was funny. So this is essentially the essence of everything I've said today is compost helps plants pump more carbon into the ground. And that's the regenerative feedback loop of life getting started. Five things to know uh, if you wanna be an advocate for healthy soil and compost as, an, uh, as a means to healthy soil, how healthy soil is actually built, meaning like what we didn't know, carbon sequestration, how watersheds and water cycles function, and how, how compost can help them, risk mitigation, how that can be helped, uh, this is for, for city landscapes. This is for regular landscapes. People are, are dealing with these things all the time. Farmers are dealing with these things all the time. Compost can play a huge role. F food health, we didn't have time to get into that today. Uh, so I had to cut it, but that's an incredible area that, that you should know about how composting is helping plants to access minerals uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have accessed. Real quick, write this one down. Over half, usually around 75% or more, of minerals that plants need, the trace minerals that plants are supposed to have are only accessible because of certain biology that are present in the root zone. So when we have dead soils, we don't get the minerals in our food. When you taste that bland tomato or strawberry, you're tasting a lack of trace minerals in your food. When you taste the good one, you can taste the plant had access to those minerals. They're now in your food and your tongue can taste them. So when we resupply the microorganisms that the plant will be working in partnership with in the soil, we get food that is healthy, actually full of nutrients again. So don't forget that. I didn't have the whole slide. I couldn't include it in the whole slideshow today, but it's prolific. If you want nutritious food, you need biology in your soil. How are you gonna get biology in your dead soil? Compost, bang. Uh, economics, obviously farmers are paying way too much for repeated costs, applications. Compost is amazing where you don't have to apply the same or more every year. You're applying less and less every year when you're doing uh, managing your ecosystem regeneratively. So this is an advertisement for you all. It's saying like all the other amendment products are more and more every year. Our amendment product is less and less every year because we're helping you regenerate your landscapes. And of course, taking out extinction. Biology starts uh, with the soil because there's all these organisms in the soil. They're the bedrock. When we restore that, we restore biodiversity uh, and all that comes with it. I encourage you all to take soil advocate training uh, at Kiss the Ground or go to Kiss the Ground and become a member so you can get updates and discounts on all our courses and materials. 
But I, in my course, so advocate training, I'm not just trying to advertise to you here. I made this course to equip any person to be able to better advocate for these subjects and to target audiences that you're trying to target and work on your presentation skills, gaining access to 300 some slides and countless other materials that can really help you uh, train yourself to be an, a more advanced advocate or salesperson or whatnot. So check that course out if you can. Um, that's it for me. I'm ready for some questions, but thanks for listening to me ramble on about this exciting topic of soil regeneration. Excellent. Thank you, Finian. Outstanding. Um, I really liked the aspect of awareness. I think it plays in very much into the International Compost Awareness Week we're in now. Um, I would think that most people on the, the webinar today probably have similar passion to you and I, Kate, Linda, and so forth, and that it is still our responsibility to go out there and continue promoting the ability of telling the compost story. I think it's wonderful. So we have had some questions that came in, and I'm going to turn it over to Kate, and she's going to read out uh, some of those questions for you to address. All right, let's get started. So we've got a question from Susan. Uh, what do you see are bar key barriers keeping municipal composting in the U.S. from building out more demand for compost, especially from the ag sector, which presumably could be a much larger end market? Great question. I think it's I think it's people being champions at the highest level and and getting buy-in. Um, so uh, my friend Calla Rose Ostrander, for example, is is really looking and navigating with the state of California on these limits of like, okay, where where are we lacking with on-farm composting? Where are we lacking with local processing of composting? It's an infrastructure problem. And Kate, the the big thing that we have to uncover here is the chemical companies and their distribution networks have worked hard and have had a profit incentive to do so. So how are we establishing that either we need much more support from the government or we need to find means and ways to have it so that this is competing with the chemical uh, giants here. So there's a lot you can do it with the advocacy level and a lot you can do with getting funding, making funding accessible so that more distribution is possible. But farmers do want quality compost. So part of that is like, are we making quality compost? You know, are you helping to advertise it? Are you the one who's making sure that this is a product that farmers want and that it's working for them? So they're getting pitched to all the time. Most farmers do want compost. And I think that there's a, a lot of room for middle people to play and then a lot of policy that can change to support uh, so that it's not all about competing just penny per penny with companies that are selling uh, selling drugs essentially. Thank you, Finian. Uh, got another question here is from Ginny. She said, so the use of compost as an amendment in a farm field is not as effective as using compost in full cover crop. Uh, it depends on what your, your outcome is. Uh, I don't remember who, who asked that, but um, so if you want to use it as amendment, by all means, it's great. And it will, it will remain, as we talked about, it's a slow release nutrient. So if you do cover crops in that late season or whatever, and you did your spring season with just as an amendment, it's still going to be there and be really viable for your cover crops. Um, but when, when they've done the trials, they did them on pasture land. So they did it on already growing grass and it just magnified the production of uh, increased the, the amount of, of grass produced per acre. So um, it's still viable. If you have a cropping system and you're doing cover crops on your off season or, or throughout the year, it'll work for all of them as it's a slow release nutrient and also has biology in it. Thank you. I'll give you a break for just a second, Finian. We've got a question from Harry and Muriel would like to answer it. Muriel's our incoming president for the North Carolina Composting Council. So Harry, Hi, Muriel. I've typically only heard that compost is a soil amendment, but now as much for adding any nutrients. How has this information changed now? So Muriel, if you wanna go ahead and answer that question. Do you give her post ability? Yeah, yeah, she just has to unmute. And if not, Finian, if you'd like to take it. Sorry, can you say the question? Absolutely, yep. I've typically only heard that compost is a soil amendment, but now as much for adding any nutrients. 
how has this information changed now? But not as much for adding nutrients? That's what it says, yep. Okay, so this is around the nutrient of food. Is that what we're talking about? I would assume so. I don't know if Harry wants to add any additional. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the biology question, I think this is, is super important. So if you look at fertile, regular fertilizer, most regular fertilizers, some of them now have like mycorrhizal fungi added in there, right? And that's going to help your plants to have a mycorrhizal fungi relationship so that the mycorrhizal fungi are out mining minerals and making them accessible for the plant, right? Cool. But um, with compost, you're bringing in biology that the plant is going to be incentivized to work with. So the plant's going to share with them, they're going to proliferate their populations. And as I said before, literally certain minerals are not available. Certain trace minerals are not available to a plant unless some microorganism has eaten another microorganism. Like, so we have to recognize when we don't have proliferating life in our soils and it's mostly dead, most agriculture has been working on the chemical spectrum and not on the biological spectrum. Uh, compost really needs to leverage its place in this, this oncoming onslaught really of moving towards uh, biological approaches. Compost, if it gets left in the dust there, it's gonna be really sad because it's such an amazing product that all humans can participate in creating. So we need to make sure that, uh, that, that the properly made compost is uh, in the works to help this move from chemical farming over to biological farming. Thank you. We've got a question from uh, Kay. Can compost stand alone as a growth medium, or is it best when combined with soil? If combined, have you a recommendation on percent compost versus percent native soil? I am not an expert enough to answer that. I know it really depends on how your compost is made and what plants you're using. Uh, but in most cases, it's pretty hard for most plants to only survive in compost. Some of them love it. But again, I, I, from what I know, I, I wouldn't want to answer this one. I'd let someone else do it. But it's, it is case by case. But Kate, maybe you have another answer for that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and let Gary jump in on that one. Yeah, so you're correct, Feeney, and it does depend on some on what type of compost you'd be utilizing. Uh, if you look at most recommendations, including the USCC, it's recommended you do not use more than 30% compost blended with soil. I know there are folks that will use straight compost, and if it's a very low nutrient, low in salts, then you know, it's a little more viable to do that, but it's strongly recommended that you do use it as a little against what you were saying as a soil amendment. So it is truly amending into the soil. So I would re recommend using more than 30% of the compost, especially if it's a higher nutrient compost. And I think just want to add where this can get confusing is people might see uh, in their compost bin be like, oh, my tomatoes grew right out of my compost bin. Be like, no, they're actually also penetrating the soil right beneath the compost bin. And there's compost, so it's really great. It was an amazing amendment, but it's it's, it's not necessarily that the tomatoes were just growing in straight compost. So just maybe, maybe that was a potential hang up for some folks just because of the, the visual there, but. All right, we've got a question from Marion. Can you speak more on how lack of nutrients creates lack of flavor? I think this is a huge selling point for compost. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, take soil advocate training. We have a whole section on this, um, but there's incredible, research coming out now, uh, for those of you who are, are aware of the Bionutrient Food Association, uh, they're showing that um, when we have nutrient uh, dense food, uh, the tastes are very parallel to that. And there's obviously uh, some cases where uh, high sugar based on, on, on breeding and stuff comes out where something's not necessarily great for you, but tastes great. That's pretty rare, but mo in most cases, uh, when you're tasting uh, the good stuff, it does have the nutrients. So your tongue is a pretty great monitor of that. And the biology in the soil is, is so indicative of that. So check out the Bionutrient Food Association, take soil advocate training if you want to get more into it. But yeah, I think it's a huge one. Again, as I said, the chemical argument in the next 10 years has to come to a close. We have to close out that the way to solve all your farm crisis is just add more chemicals because literally we're turning the world to a desert and it sucks. The biology argument is finally getting its, its rightful place and compost needs to play a huge part in that. And so that's where I would say, yes, learn as much as you can about this nutrient thing. 
But also I warn people, don't make really broad sweeping comments of just like, if you don't have compost, you don't have nutrient dense food. Don't, don't make generalizations that are gonna make you uh, easily arguable with. I right, got a question from Aaron. As a large composter, how can we get the message across to non-compost believers? Uh, is Aaron, can, it, can we pull Aaron up to do a little session of, of how he would talk about it? I think so, give me just a second. All right, Aaron, welcome to the stage, Aaron. Let me see. Maybe, I'm trying, it's not letting me. Uh... While, while, you're, while you're waiting, I, I would say how first and foremost is how would you say it? Um, that's what I, I really start with. And oh, there, there he is. No? I think he dropped off now. Oh, I don't know. Got, I can tell. got scared maybe. Um, wait, can you say, say the question one more time? I just want to get it reframed here. Yep, looks like they're actually a panelist now, so they might be able to. Um, just a second. As a large composter, how can we get the message across to the non-compost believers? Yeah, I think that's, that's first tough just because of non-compost believers. I think we need to find out who your target audience is. Is that Aaron? <laughs> that's Aaron. This hi. Is, hi, I'm the one that asked the question. I was meaning that, you know, we, we work with a lot of the agricultural community that still is reliant on synthetic fertilizers and it's been a really big challenge. We make a lot of compost and we do is on, on, on some talking points around the non-compost users that still are out there. You cut out for a second, but I think I got what you're saying. Uh, you guys are producing compost and, and, and wanting to find more markets for it. Is that right? For farmers? Yeah, I want to get to the market that's not using compost and have some very you know pithy ways of talking about compost use. I'm just kind of curious your take on it. Yeah, I think... Uh, I do think the, the route that we're talking about with connecting it to regenerative agriculture. So I would say that using Kiss the Ground, the film and other tools to start to entice people in and start to see where are you having people who are aware and moving more towards regenerative practices or where have they already started to on-road with the US government and some of the programs that are offered around soil health management, but get yourself into the soil health conversation and then start to be playing a part. Because you got to remember, Aaron, that the chemical salespeople are going to these places, meeting with these people and sharing their, their version of it and becoming closer with them. So I would say, number one, using the tools. Number two, sharpening your story of this. Not, not blowing smoke up anybody's whatever, but like telling them like, look, what we're excited about and what we even didn't know was when we talk about the combination of cover cropping and, and no-till and compost, this is what we're getting. And I can connect you with experts like Carrie Crum, who can be like, if you're gonna sell this to a, comp a farmer, you're gonna have to show them some results and the results are gonna have to be great the first time so that they're a believer in it. So uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think the first thing is using your tools and sharpening your story of why it's actually regenerative and if it's in their combination. And then I would say, don't target all producers just to use compost. Find people who are already on the path of regenerative because their likelihood of success using your compost is much higher because they're not just doing it at a happenstance. They're actually thinking about regenerating their land and therefore the other areas. We always say regenerative practices have to come with other regenerative practices. You can't just apply compost and then do uh, uh, stripping and large tilling and leaving your brown gown covered no success is going to come with your composting. But if you're doing cover crops, plant grazing, all these other things, composting can play a huge contribution to that. So I would say get yourself deep in that world of, of why it's regenerative and why it's going to help them on their path to soil health. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for jumping up. I was going to have you do like a whole thing, but it took a little bit of time, but uh, we'll, we'll do that next time. Okay, no problem. Thanks. All right, we're going to do one final question, and that's from Mary. 
How are the big chemical companies pushing back and what actions can we take to counter their positions and arguments? Um, I honestly think the big chemical companies are prepping to move into biologicals too. So I think getting ahead of the curve on being the OGs of, of biology is really important and not letting them win in that. I wouldn't say fighting them on their, their side, that's, you can you disprove that their stuff works pretty easily with, with backing research. Uh, but remember they have profits at their back. So this is where combined efforts, this is where getting uh, people on our side, winning the argument in the hearts and minds of lawmakers, having them see it, having them touch it, feel it, experience it, you know, uh, and, and see the results. Um, and this is where as a champion of soil health or a champion of regenerative agriculture, as if you start to identify as your purpose isn't just to sell compost, each of you can ask yourself like, why? Why do I care about compost? If you care about compost just because it's your job, maybe get another job. If you're connected to why you're here and you learn something today or you've learned other things and you're, you're passionate about this, harness that because that is what's going to give access to someone else who has either been, you know, whatever about it or, or isn't connected to it as much as they could be. You become that invitation and, and gravity pull to bring them in. So I think it's about winning hearts and minds here and especially the communities that we're targeting, farmers and lawmakers uh, and, and policymakers for the landscape stuff of like, look, we can do this and compost does work here are these results that show it and as talk about water, talk about, you know, one thing really quick is I worked with the, the, um, the waste hauling in Los Angeles was about to put out an RFP for a completely new waste haul system here. And their language around composting was like a half a page of just self-congratulatory stuff about what they've done in the past. And I was like, this can't go out for the next 10 years, have contracts for waste haulers with nothing around composting. So I brought a group together and we rewrote an entire spec for composting and they literally took everything for the RFP and they put it out. And now we have, you know, 10 years of law for compost for all of these waste haulers to be providing this means of compost. Why I'm saying that is I, we took something that was existing and we added on to say compost is good for the environment. Compost is a water thing. Compost is a health thing. Compost is a carbon thing. And we started to provide these arguments. And then we backed it up with what should happen and we did the work. So uh, meeting your representatives, go start talking to them and have them like, this is an opportunity for them to learn something. You're giving them access to information that they want. You're helping their staff write legislation. Be willing to do it. Uh, don't just be sitting there being like, why aren't you guys supporting me? Be like, well, maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't have the time to write the legislation. So write it, let them sign their name on it and be there for it. Like just insert yourself and don't, don't stress out too much. Excellent. Well, we have reached the end of our hour and we could go on for a while here. Many questions have popped up. I do just want to make one quick comment in regards to the questions. There was a couple on persistent herbicides and clopyrrolid in particular. Uh, Linda did post in the chat uh, a great resource through the US Composting Council. So if you do have some questions on that, because that is certainly a, a huge concern in our industry, uh, feel free to reach out to there. Uh, Finian, on behalf of the North Carolina Composting Council, the other state chapters, CREF, USCC, and all those other wonderful acronyms, uh, really want to thank you for your time, uh, your wonderful knowledge, and as I mentioned in the beginning, your passion. It really started coming through at the end there, even more so when you start getting those questions. Um, I, I, I wanted to jump in and say things many times, like, oh, I can answer that one too. So uh, thank you very, you very should much. Have, you should have, for sure. Uh, um, no, no, I'd it, love to do this again, Gary and, and Kate, if you're up for it, Linda. Um, I, I love connecting with you all. We're, we're launching a campaign called Regenerate America, and it's going to be a full-fledged campaign for uh, the next farm bill, farm bill reformation, and compost, by golly, will be a big part of it. So we're going to need your all support. So look out for announcements from Kiss the Ground on Regenerate America. If you want to get involved in the Soil Advocate Program, amazing, but if you want to just become a member and stay in touch with us, 
so you can be aware of everything <clears throat> or just follow us on, on the onlines so you can see what we're up to. But Regenerate America is going to be a 10 million goal signature campaign for reformation of the farm bill and uh, compost is, is right in there. So um, we're going to need your all support. So I look forward to working with you on that later uh, this year and into 2022 and 23. Well, great. We look forward to it. So thank you again, Kate. Thank you for your help. And for everyone that attended and registered, uh, keep building that awareness. A lot of great opportunity. Compost is a hot topic right now. And uh, I I'm so proud to be part of this industry. Finian, thanks again. Everybody have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care.